Hello everybody, we are again uh, live in uh, our next Training Tuesday. Today I uh, was wondering uh, about some positions which i like to show you from Tata Steel and how we can learn from them, um, especially when I wanted to concentrate on some of the topics we had before, um, like in the end game how we can use these uh, role changes uh, like uh, why you maybe remember we wanted to activate the king, uh, activate our pawns and of course our pieces. And um, to start with it, uh, I wanted to show you one of the uh, exciting games between Navara and Giri, uh, who ended in a draw in the end after a really tense fight. Um, as you could have seen, there are many uh, well, reports and broadcasts already about the, all the tactic stuff. What I actually wanted to show you is one of the interesting positions which arose in the end um, and the questions which can be uh, about is what do we know exactly about this um, these changes between the queen and the two rooks because um, as we know from the counting points of Yoa, our world champion, uh, we know that the rooks are 5 points, so uh, together they are 10, and uh, the queen, uh, who has 9 points, so needs to have 1 pawn. The basic is very logical, um, because um, the two rooks can always make a battery uh, together and just take the pawn, even though uh, they are protected by king and queen. So not to lose the opponent game, uh, we should always keep in mind that the queen always has the necessary pawn. In this position the pawn will just be for deflecting. Um, if black wishes to capture the pawn on a2, he should allow perpetual check with the king. So this position is actually interesting and I wanted to show you some instructive positions which, um, which was from uh, the past times and it was one of the studies which we will know uh, from the game of um, uh, study of Gokunitsa against Aferbach and it occurred from this position. Um, White is ready, uh, has two rooks, and we will notice that uh, black has actually one point down. Is actually one point, point down. Um, he needs one extra pawn, uh, so he's facing already some difficulties. Um, as we will see. Okay, let's go on. Uh, king goes to g1, f5, rook to e1. Um, he tries to double the rooks and in this case already brings the black king in trouble. Um, which of course is still possible for black to defend in a very passive way. Um, but we will see that um, now comes a very interesting and instructive way how white can win. Because uh, before, before uh, I already mentioned that um, the two rooks will just aim at the pawn, can take it and we will win the pawn on game. In this position this is not possible because the pawns are not weak enough uh, to be attacked. Um, so he played f4, um, allowing some checks and white simply goes to h3, the queen goes back. Now we will notice that if we try to deliberate uh, the king from h3 uh, towards the black position, uh, he should not allow the check. So we will first uh, protect those squares with rook b7, just to be able to, um, uh, to secure the square on b2, and it gives some opportunity to uh, come with the king. In this case, queen a2 is checked, so also this one we will try to avoid. Now we see that the black queen is restricted to queen h8, queen g8 to protect the mating square on h7 so the white king can start his run. As we know that we are, have three ways of activating um, the, um, the pieces. Uh, so we want the rooks are already active, pawns are already in position. Uh, Tuk, uh, making black into Tsuktuang and now the king approaches the position. 
we can make some check he will continue running and in this case we can use the other rook just to prevent further checks and the black queen goes back queen d3 queen d8 queen c4 and goes back again and this is quite interesting because in this way you see that the white king approaches um, without allowing uh, any uh, perpetual checks or any way of uh, drawing mechanism um, so as said before black um, yeah stays passive and now we should have a small uh, thought because here there's an interesting way how you can exploit um, the position um, of course one idea could be uh, that we play uh, king d8 d6 uh, but after queen d8 king e6 queen e8 there are a lot of checks again and it will be tough to win but we here we can use as if we would um, um, yes if we would take a pawn we would just exchange the rooks and enter the king with the position king d5 and king e6 and what's important is um, if you want to have a quick access assessment of this position then actually you will notice that we need on either side um, you will need uh, uh, you need to uh, six squares and white has six squares but black doesn't so it means that black can't copy white moves Black should be now on the third rank on the white square to be able to make opposition, and this is not the case. And white uh, is one. So what is interesting about this example? It gives very clear uh, the material balance between the two rooks and the queen, um, and we see that in this way the rooks were simply strong and could even outplay the queen. Uh, by threatening mate and keeping it in passive position. Another nice example which I wanted to share with you today uh, was the example, uh, another one, uh, but now the queen is the, on the stronger side. I mean it would be really fair, unfair to, um, to give only bad examples for the queen because still the queen is very powerful and we see in this position that even black has an extra pawn uh, he is in trouble and especially we can notice that the king on h5 is of course in some way it's safe because there are not many ways to check but one could be enough and um, it's clear that if black could go one row back maybe h7 king h6 uh, and so on then he would probably have an easy win but that's none of the case and we will see how uh, white will exploit this fact. We will give first some check. Well, we will see that in this case um, there's not much done on king h4, queen h3 is simply made. So we should go for rook g4, king h3, rook a4. If you would play rook g5 then I immediately could play g3 uh, making an instantly um, a tuk twang for black and there's no way to uh, to save the game so king h3 rook a4 um, now we play the move uh, queen d5 and this is another interesting move because uh, there are three ways to check the king from f7, from f3, and from the d file, and even queen d1. Uh, all the time he needs to pay attention to both of his rooks. Um, if he would play g5 in this position, it would be already uh, decisive because we will play queen f7, mate. No. So rook g5 only move and of course if we give now checks on d1 he will be still able to play rook g5, g4 and still can hold on. Um, but we force him to play the move which he doesn't want to make and we can do it with g4. Uh, again um, if he takes the, the pawn which is actually necessary because 
we need to get out of the, out of the checks, we simply play queen of three. And unfortunately for black he has to move. This is also one of the important things to remember that in uh, queen end games we, in 90% or maybe even more, we will win uh, the position simply because of uh, Tukstorm, which is very important. Uh, especially in end games with rook, uh, queen against rook and pawn, you will see that uh, Tukstorm is one of the most uh, important uh, techniques we need to apply to win the position. Black plays his rook away, queen g4 mate. Very nice. So we see that uh, both um, has their strength. Uh, the queen of course is very dangerous with a double attack and when the king is in danger uh, the black rooks are very good in exchange to a favorable endgame um, and in this uh, uh, in this way we can make use of it. One other example and last one which I want to show you is in uh, a famous game of Anand uh, who was playing um, um, in, uh, in championships. Um, let me get it. Let me see if I, I need to get it here. I'm sorry. And we get the selection uh, which is his game uh, against Shirov and from this um, I need to import in this way so I hope I will get it now yes here it is so we see that uh, from this game uh, we also learn another very important technique um, Rooks are very strong when they coordinate because we make batteries and from this battery we always gain material. Uh, the queen is very strong in this double attack. So when you uh, consider if you would like to make a queen exchange, uh, always keep in mind how many um, uh, outposts uh, the pieces will have to stabilize themselves and so you can coordinate them and in this way you can um, uh, yeah, you can exploit them and of course when, when you have pieces and you will see that your opponent can do it or you are simply end up in the position with the pieces uh, always try to coordinate them because that will save you or even that will be the way uh, to get into better position um, so what we will see is that Anand uh, mainly focus on getting his coordination between the rooks of course the a-pawn is still very dangerous and um, well the pawns on e5, h5 can be long term very weak. Uh, so there will be some tense fight and here is another interesting move because white wants to stick to the rooks because if he w would play let's say in just very uh, uh, well that in most of the moves Okay, let's say that he still has to attack the rook, but maybe later on he can just try to defend, um, let's say queen d7, and imagine I would just play rook f8, and he would just make a simple move like here. Then you will see that black will be able to play rook a6, and with the idea of uh, getting his rook to a8, the pawn on a4 will be very vulnerable. So what is the main defense of uh, white is to stick to the rooks so they have no time to uh, to, to double themselves um, and that's what we will see uh, by the way which is also a good question is why not rook d4 after white can play queen c6 if we take he will be able to um, exchange one of the pawns and in this case the king um, will be too vulnerable so there are too many perpetual checks and like in the game of Geary there are no way of um, um, yeah of doubling the rooks on the second rank or on g5 in the second rank to attack g2 and gain it and win the pawn end game rook dc8 queen b7 rook e8 very important because now there's a very interesting move because in this case if white will simply play rook d7 
just a um, uh, queen d7, sorry. It's not possible. Uh, I can't make this move somehow. Um, so if we want to play queen d7, uh, we play rook e6, and uh, after rook e6, we are able to play queen a6. So therefore, we need to play queen c6 to attack rook e8 and rook e8 at the same time so they won't be able to double his rook. So he tries to do it in another way, we still stick, we attack. Um, for example now you can see that um, he could have played queen b5, we play rook e6, a5. Um, now there are two ways, either you can pick up the e-pawn or the a-pawn, uh, both look very good. Rook e8 takes rook h5 and rook a5, very important. This move will guarantee us that the a-pawn will never, uh, can, uh, can never promote and we can simply uh, yeah, march with our king and pawns uh, towards the, our opponent. Uh, after queen c7, um, the game uh, lasted longer. But uh, black won in a similar way. He played rook. He could play rook d5, taking the pawn on e5, and uh, the pawns would get lost. So what I liked very much about the position and what was reminding me while I was uh, watching the game of Navarra against um, Giri is that. Um, um, yes, that we uh, that we always need to think about this uh, coordination between pieces. This is so important, and White can only attack like crazy to see if we can make double attacks or if we see to we can make other tricks, maybe a perpetual check, because as uh, soon the pieces are coordinated, there's no way to escape. So this was a very nice first example which I wanted to show with you and um, I wanted to go to another one. Um, it was the position between um, uh, um, Caruana and um, um, one moment. Let's go to the other one. So we we will go to the game of Caruana and Adams. Uh, Adams is having uh, some tough times when he's playing black. He already lost two games, so I hope for him better black times will come uh, in the tournament. Um, and in this position, he. Um, it was a very tense fight, as we will see. Um, and I want to pick up the game uh, at this moment, queen a4. It was an interesting um, choice. Um, and actually, this is um, um, yeah, mainly what I liked very much about this position. Um, was the fact that um, he made some exchange. Which of course after uh, g takes f5, queen b4, um, black has the double pawn but has a very good outpost on e4 while uh, white with knight on e5 can be still chased away with f6. Um, I think the position should be balanced but um, in some way it feels that black um, has a little bit easier game to make progress. Um, um, there are many open files for his rooks and yeah, um, it, it's good. The only difficulty of course is that uh, since he has a double pawn um, on the f-file it's very difficult for him to make tension with pawns which means it's very difficult to create any extra um, activity. Uh, so he played f6, um, knight f3, uh, knight b8 um, after queen e1, um, um, activity. 
and um, so let's go to this one. Sorry, I will just adjust the position a little bit. So we are back. Um, so we play knight c6 um, after rook d2, bishop d2, and this is an interesting position, mainly also about the question. Um, um, that how bad are these bishops because we have many books about uh, the bishops and the pawns should be on uh, on the same color because we can protect them but of course in some way we wish to have active bishops and in that case we need to have active uh, we want to have mobility in active bishops um, I think that the basic Capablanca rules which are um, um, I would like to call them Capablanca rules because Capablanca was the one who played most often in these kind of um, um, positions and he tried to adjust the pawns as much as possible uh, to his bishop um, because yeah, simply you control more squares, you're more active and especially in strategic way you can create more activity because always pawn tension is the uh, basic of uh, creating um, activity. So uh, this bishop on d2 is usually uh, called a bad bishop though um, I think that the bishop has a very good task. He is protecting e3 and we don't need to worry about it especially since the pawn on d5 and f5 uh, keeps the pawn on e3 on its place so it's important for us to um, yeah, to protect it and if he's going to double his rooks or maybe even with queen triple uh, the heavy pieces we will be very happy to have this piece on the board and so we won't lose any material um, the same counts a little bit for the bishop on b7 it's passive um, he wished to get it active but there's no real way to do so at the moment um, so that's the bishops at the moment are just uh, bad but the bishop on d2 is functional and that's what I prefer to call them and it's not so much about um, uh, passive and uh, I mean not so much about bad and good bishops but more about active and passive bishops or about uh, bishops who has a function or they don't King h8, um, what we will see now is there's a very long period where they maneuver uh, their pieces. Um, although the engine is always a little bit in favor of black, I still feel that when you would play this kind of positions, you feel that it's some kind of tense fight. Um, black has definitely more pressure against the position uh, with his rooks. On the other hand, he will feel that this f pawn is really uh, are two weak pawns, so you always need to be careful that white is not attacking them. And also, the bishop on c8 is really bad. Um, it's passive, it's not active, so that's really a um, piece we don't want to have. Before, it's interesting way. Um, Kar Karana is showing his spirit. He likes to um, um, to get. Uh, more active play and also um, well he tries to solve some issues in his position I mean he um, the pawn on b2 would be backward and there would still be chances for black to uh, activate his pawns later on with a6 b5 b4 uh, so he tries to prevent it and to be ready uh, when black is uh, yes yeah, ready to take such actions um, knight e7 Rook a3, um, Rook g4, Knight f3. Once more, I don't want to pay attention to all the moves, and there for sure there should there can be improvements uh, from both sides. What I just wanted to show you is um, how this um, yeah how this way of thinking of bishops, which is interesting in this position and the way how they place them because with the last move with b5 we see that he's really trying to uh, put the pawns on the opponent uh, bishop so he will restrict the activity and mobility of the bishop 
and he can create open space for his own. Uh, so the rule that we should put our pawns on the same color so we can protect them uh, like he would he could have played a5 he doesn't use this rule he wants to yeah to have chances to get active and he already had a very nice idea what he wanted to do next because in this position um, he came with some long-term plan which I wanted to show you later on in uh, with some game of uh, Yusupov um, and Tifiakov um, about how you can make progress. It's clear that he wants to improve his knight and bishop at the moment because um, they aren't doing much. And uh, then we are looking for ideal squares. Ideal squares are just you pick up a piece you have some dream and you wish to bring it to some uh, yeah to some marvelous square or just something uh, where you will be delighted about um, so in this position when I have a dream and already gave you some time to think about it what you would do yourself um, that I would like to have a bishop on b4 because I feel that I'm, it's not really necessary anymore to protect e3 with my bishop because simply rook g3, queen h3, king f2 are doing their work. And for the knight and f3, I would like to have it on c3. Because if the bishop is on b4 and the knight on c3, I will control all important squares. Uh, I will, import, I will uh, control the, the diagonal, uh, which... Um, for example, the black queen could enter my position when it would go to f8 in some time. And with the knight on c3, I just make pressure against d5. Um, I'm very sure that the position uh, would still be very fine for black, but it's just something I wish for. I feel that I make some extra progress when I would have my pieces on those squares. And yeah, in general, when we play chess, that, that's enough. Um, so he played knight g1, a5. So he's trying to stop my plan. And well, that's of course a good thing. He, he, he caught what I wanted to do. And you have two ways of uh, reacting. You can say, well, I will just make a small adju uh, adjustment. I will just play knight to c3 and bishop c1, bishop a3. Nothing changed. I'm still good and all my pieces are happy. The only difficulty is that if the center is r relatively closed, if not closed, uh, the queen side is closed, the king side is really tough to win on that side for white. I have maybe some small uh, active pieces or some activity but I will never be able to win the position. And Kalorana has always this fighting spirit and always wish to play for a win, so he took. Um, of course, this also involves some extra risk uh, because black can get active on the A-file with rook A8, rook A6. Uh, but still, um, yeah, we can continue fighting. And these moves which he's making now, I love them very much. Uh, if you see how these pieces are coordinated, how they uh, find their place and how the control squares, you have a5, b5, c5, because that's one of the points when we are playing chess and especially when you will play uh, or you want to play uh, chess on a higher level, uh, you have to seek for positions where a lot of squares next to each other you control. So your opponent will not have a way to get through your position. Um, the game went on very long still. Um, and for the moment um, I want to stop uh, this game. Um, but I wanted to show you this, this idea on uh, of how he get his knight from f3 to c3 and the bishop on b4 and how he try, was trying to adjust his pawns to his bishop. Uh, I think this is one of the main points of, the, um, uh, of playing good chess. Um, and um, 
Also, what is important when you see the, to those grandmasters, uh, you see that they play with extremely much patience. Um, they are not in a hurry, they are not in a rush, they don't have something like, wait, uh, it's almost 6 o'clock, I need to get for dinner ready, so let's make some fast moves. No, they take all the time which is necessary to play the position, and if your opponent makes good moves, then you have to, yeah, you have to sit and wait. Uh, uh, maybe he won't make any mistakes today, and maybe the game would even make uh, it would be a draw. But as we always try to um, to play in the spirit of Fisher, which I always liked one of his quotes: um, "If you want to win, give your opponent counterplay." So that's also one of the things which is always important in such kind of positions. Maybe the position w would have been drawn. But I'm not sure if Adams would already settle for a draw. I think that Adams was playing for a win as much as Caruana did. So both are fighting for their chances. And that's the interesting thing about chess is that sometimes you have positions both want to win. And of course, as we know, very often there can only be one winner in the end. Um, uh, when it comes to championships uh, and of course but of course for the games uh, it could end in a draw but still we would love to see it and to see that it's a fighting one um, okay so as I mentioned before um, I wanted to show you this game um, um, from um, uh, the, where they also maneuver and one of them was this famous game of um, of Yusupov and Yusupov was playing with white pieces and in these white pieces um, he yeah we have to consider what's going on and we have to learn from our past um, uh, yeah our previous example um, the most in question, important question which I have um, for you today is which bishop is the best? And um, actually, we should make a top three. I mean, we have the bishop on f8 and c8, and white has the bishop on d3. And the one million dollar question, of course, is which of those bishops is the best? So I would like you have some small. Um, uh, small thought and uh, I have the chat screen now in my uh, vision uh, so maybe one of you uh, can make a proposal and to see um, yeah which move uh, which bishop uh, should be the best so maybe one of you can give some us some clue what would be your solution which bishop is the very very best is active and functional which bishop is second and which bishop will be the third so um, let's see if one of you can give me some clue about it while we will consider all the other interesting uh, things um, let me discuss some of the other points before I will give you the answer of the bishops uh, when we look to the pawn structure and the knight um, for the knight we see some nice square on c4 um, uh, and we have some pawns it should be interesting to think about which side we are stronger and I have already some small clue for Mr. Astond. Uh, he said definitely not d3, it has no good squares for now. So now is the question, are you agreeing with him and if not d3, which one is the best? So can you help me out to figure out this position, which is the best bishop? Uh, he gives some uh, more the bishop on f I would say the bishop on f8 because uh, once you go to g7 uh, we go to um, um, and we can play f5 he has the diagonal 
Thank you very much for your answer. Um, let us consider um, how we would look to the position. Um, I think that when we look to the literature, most of most of you would go for bishop c8. Um, the classical definition of uh, good bishops is that they should be adjusting uh, the pawns in the center, which means that the black pawns are all on black squares and the white bishop is very active and can just get active. Um, of course, it can be interesting because if the bishop goes to g7 and you cast, you play f5, if I take and you can get the pawn to e4, we will see that the pawns will exactly do the same thing. Um, the black bishop have, will have an open diagonal, the pawns are on white, and we will have a fantastic bishop. The only difficulty is, and in this way I need to disappoint you a little bit, Mr. Uh, Astond, um, we won't take on f5 for that reason. I don't want you to get a very good bishop. Um, I know it's a very mean thing. Um, but um, we, uh, we, yeah, we will try to get uh, control of e4. Um, so I think the bishop, if it wants to get active, it should go to h6 to, to have an open diagonal. But on the other hand, the knight goes to c4 and we will see that this bishop doesn't have much function. I mean, it's controlling the diagonal to... Uh, uh, that's uh, we are go we are aiming for C the this diagonal to c1, but it's not the case. Yeah, for sure. Always, uh, always give your answers. We are here for learning, and that's the whole thing. And that's why I like this uh, this instruction example so much, is because the bishop on d3 is actually the best bishop. Why? Uh, the bishop on c8 is actually defending a6, while bishop on d3 is attacking a6. Uh, a bishop on d3 is controlling the center, which is important because that's the reason why I can play for the flanks. And we will just see in some moves how things develop. We first play a5, um, placing a6 on a square, so the bishop on d3 will always have an attacking object. Think about football playing. Uh, the, the bishop on d3 can make a goal. We can attack a6 and the bishop on c8 is actually looking to a3 where there's nothing. He will not reach our king or any other attacking object. So, and the bishop on g7 has, yeah, said um, it can go to a6, which is a nice diagonal, but in, we are in time to escape from exchanging and then he's a little bit looking into the air. c3, this is the main move. Very important. We try to make tension, as, men as mentioned before, um, we need tension to get activity. And in this way, we will get play over the b-file uh, to support our knight on b6, or maybe in the end we can have a rook on b6 and attack a6 or d6. So we see that all the white pieces from the center will attack all the, uh, all the attacking objects. So he took f5, rook b1, here the bishop already gets a little bit more active on e4, we are aiming at g6 a little bit, um, of course well, black tries to attack, we defend, we control the center, bishop f8, knight b6. And now comes an interesting moment, because usually um, we don't want to exchange a knight on b6, which is so strong in opponent's position, for the bishop on c8, which is actually only defending. But as mentioned, um, the bishops can sometimes be very functional, like in the French. The bishop on d7 is protecting e6, and you won't get e6 without exchanging that bishop. We have the famous example of Fischer against Petrochan who was exchanging his knight for, uh, on c5 against d7 uh, while um, I think it was neither of he was uh, shouting in the commentary room how can he make this move and after several moves when Fischer won the game he was just sighing and saying he plays so simple and that's the point Passive bishops, uh, literature, uh, in the literature we call them passive bishops, 
are very often very functional and sometimes it's just good to exchange them uh, so there are more ways to exploit other weaknesses. Like in this case you have a very nice substitute for the knight on b6. We attack d6 and a6 and he plays uh, and we can get even active play on the king side. A g3 is um, uh, again you don't want to play f3 which is very common uh, and I hear uh, this move in the training very often uh, but that's not the best move because uh, we never know um, if one of the black pieces will get around and get in our position and then the king can be vulnerable. If we play g3 we see that uh, the king can get to white square where, which means that the bishop will never ever be able to check. The bishop on e4 will always be supportive to control checking squares. The queen on e2 will be and we have the advantage of playing, being able to play h4, h5, making tension again and who knows we will make another attacking object. So we see that this adjusting of pawn structure is very important. Um, rook f8, king g2, and actually this is a small inaccuracy. Uh, he should have played rook b1 at the moment, so he would be um, uh, a rook a1. Sorry, he should have played rook a1 because in that case he could have um, protected a5. So when the queen goes, we can take on a6. In the game, he was a little bit too late. Um, because after taking comes rook a8 and bishop d8 and the pawn on a5 will drop. Um, so that's a bit unfortunate, um, but uh, after some small inaccuracy of black, rook b7 wasn't the best. Um, white went on a win with h5 and queen g4. Uh, aiming at all those squares and again uh, getting all these attacking objects. He um, queen e7 to protect e6 and now comes also again h6. Fantastic move. He just put the pawns on the white so he can attack them and he puts his pawns on black so they will be just adjusting. Uh, the fact that black might be able to uh, attack h6 uh, could, have, could have happened. But you should understand that when he takes, rook h1 is coming. Um, and anyway, it's very time consuming. Uh, there are many weaknesses in the black position, so he doesn't have time to get them. Uh, rook b8, uh, bishop d3, reminding black that the pawn on a6 is also very weak. Um, now comes some small exchange. And this is again, we see that even though black might be very bad, uh, he's still fighting for his squares. Um, the black bishop needs to get active diagonals. You want to get some active play. Uh, and maybe if black is lucky, uh, white is not paying attention with one or two passive moves, he might be able to play queen e5, d5, getting stronger control of the white squares. But not this game. White is paying very much attention to, um, to his squares, play bishop c8, going for exchange of queens and reminding that he didn't only make a weak pawn on a6 but even one on h7. Black is already struggling to uh, play some even some sound moves and white played very simple. He just was placing the rook out of play and uh, with the rook against bishop he had an easy win. Once more, um, when, when we go back, uh, we see what is important to remind from this game is that we see that active bishops, which has function, that's the one what we want to aim for. We want to have, um, if the bishop is not active, we try to do so. If he's not functional, to give him a function. Those terms give you much more uh, way to think about position in a, in a good way. Uh, so please pay attention. Second, uh, always think about that when pawns are adjusting your bishop, you have double as much squares under control. Uh, it means also that you can keep pawns on this place so you can attack them more easily. And of course pawns can be used to make tension so you get more activity. 
those things are important and that was something which I um, yeah I was remembering uh, while I was watching the game between Car One and Adams. Um, I had um, two interesting positions still to make and one of them was the position between um, between between Ding and Adams and again as mentioned um, Adams was yeah um, was a moment had difficult times with black and in this game thing um, was getting good play again um, as we will see I'm importing the game so we get it and here we go um, so we start the position um, around this time and it's um, 12 move and white is already nicely centralized and has some more space Catalan bishop on g2 uh, looking to c6 and b7 and in this game we have um, the famous uh, Bodwinic knight chase um, which will be the last example which I want to examine you today um, the knight chase is simply we have the knight on b6 which is looking to the center and very often we can play a4 and the strength of a4 is that we threat a5 a, and immediately a6 so there's a double threat of this pawn and in this way we will again destroy the pawn structure and the bishop on g2 will become a monster um, so black is playing bishop f8 a5 knight c4 a6 even white uh, is sacrificing a pawn to get his active pieces. Look at the bishop on d4, rook on a1, bishop on g2, all are attacking the queen side. So most likely all those pawns will be gone at some moment and you will have just a pawn extra like 4 against 3. And that's the whole idea about this a4, a5, a6 plan. It's, uh, you can re remind it as Botwinik's knight chase. Unfortunately we don't have time today to uh, to look at it, but if you want, uh, it's the famous game from him against Boleslavski in 1941, and uh, there you can see, uh, yeah, why the name is given to this uh, remarkable world champion. Knight b2, queen d2, knight c4, queen f4. White is slightly uh, improving his position, not, uh, not. Um, yeah, having any troubles or any worries about that if he would get his pawn back or not, he's just simply activating and again we always centralize our pieces. Once more, I noticed that if you want to improve your play, play much more central. Um, I see that all the games from the Grandmasters, after let's say 14 to 60 moves, they developed all their pieces and they all centralized. When we look to our own games, very often we see that we all played some mighty tiny moves here and there and we don't manage, we don't manage it. Uh, what I would like to advise you is simply, you don't have to invent uh, the game of chess. We already know that with every move we need to develop a new piece, so try to stick to this plan. I know that there are all kinds of faults that we could play differently, but... Um, if we look backwards, if we analyze positions, we will see that all the time to uh, develop new pieces is simply better. We just need them. Um, and you can see that all the grammars even take it as granted. They don't try to become creative in the opening uh, that much. Um, they normally try to play sound and profound chess. Um, and so keep this in mind when you want to yeah, to play uh, more complicated or you want to play a lot with the same piece, keep in mind that that's not the spirit how we yeah develop our pieces. 
Bishop d6, queen c1, bishop e5, um, even exchanging. So you see that he's not even worried about some pieces will be exchanged. Rook d1, centralizing. Knight e4. He took on a6. It's difficult to say what could be, could be better. f4, queen c6, and now again queen d6. He's and this is interesting. Uh, normally we are used that when we have a uh, material disadvantage we shouldn't exchange pieces, especially not queens. But here you can see that he has full control of the position. The knight on g6 is bad. We can see that there could be later on some again some knight chase of Botwinik with h4, h5. Uh, well, I'm very sure the pawns on the queen side can't be saved in long term. And of course, white again could bring his king into the center. Uh, bishop g4, queen e7, rook d2. Simply av uh, avoiding that black could enter the position with rook b2. King f2 can be, um, can be played. e2 is under control, so what could happen? h6, preventing mate, we take a pawn. Attacking the knight. Uh, and the knight simply goes back to c3, protecting e2, and after rook c4 we play rook a3. And again, here you can see something similar to what happened to Caruana. He's protecting all his pieces in a very nice way, um, controlling most important squares. Uh, he has a very easy plan, a king f2, maybe e4, e5, um, or yeah, at some point you also have to be careful that knight e5 or can just take on a7. So there are many good moves and for black it's pretty tough to hold the end game. Uh, king f2, rook c7, knight e5, rook c2. He exchanged one pair of rook which in normally favors white a little bit. Uh, still maybe here he was hoping that the pressure against e2 would give him some extra play. Uh, bishop f1, trying to keep his pieces active, we collect one pawn and you see that in the end he, was, uh, he achieved his aim. He was trying to exchange all these pawns um, um, on the queen side while he uh, would last with his four against three pawns on the king side. Uh, he mean, managed to do so and um, once more I will not show you the whole game. Uh, but later on he went on uh, for a win. Very impressive and very good game. Um, and reminding us that we need to centralize our pieces, we need to uh, yeah, to get active played and this, this maneuver of um, uh, uh, of Botwinik with knight chase with a4, a5 is something to remind yourself. Um, I will show you once more um, this idea can be applied in any position um, and one of the interesting thing uh, of course for the Dutch fans of Giri uh, was, uh, was his win over um, um, Topalov in the first game of uh, London which actually was maybe not a very convincing one because for a long time Topalov was really better but an astonishing uh, move um, he managed to trick him in the end and won. What I wanted to, to show you is the <coughs> sorry um, was the moment in this game which um, I think it, this is more than chess. Uh, it's a very sharp uh, uh, contest between them uh, a fight about the center with modern principles uh, white has spare a bishop, but of course uh, black has this f fabulous knight on d3, the octopus, uh, how Kasparov uh, called it uh, from his match against Karpov. Um, so it's very dynamic and very interesting. And here Topolov uh, applies this uh, Botwinik's knight chase in a very interesting way. And I think this is modern chess. We still, they have in mind all these old structures. You know, you should know these classical games. You need to study them. Because you see that in all kinds of positions, now with much more tactics like you can see here. Uh, but still they make these old moves. 
which ha come from the same system. In this position, a4, a5 is not uh, meant to destroy the pawn structure with a6, like in a previous example. No, it's one way to get the rook active at a4. And uh, also the other point was that the knight on b6 was still controlling d5, but you, you see that after I play a5, the knight goes to passive bad square and um, we managed to uh, yeah to get uh, the central pawn on d5 with very active play. Um, um, so once more you see that uh, to study if you want to improve your chess you need to study those classic games. One of the books I can um, advise you to study which has a lot of examples which I was mentioning today is Techniques of Positional uh, Play. It's made by, an, um, when I write about a Georgian, uh, Anatoly uh, Tirikin. And uh, this is, uh, has a lot of good examples uh, which everybody should know if you want to play proper chess and you want to understand something about um, yeah, uh, positional chess. Uh, so this is a very nice book. Uh, which I'm happy to advise you to study, um, which hopefully can give you examples like here to, uh, yeah, to challenge your opponent uh, with uh, nice strategic ideas. So one of them uh, we saw today uh, was uh, this night chase like Botwinik. Before we saw the Capablanca rules uh, where the bishop was really stronger uh, when it could attack something, when it is active and it has function. And the first one, we saw some example of queen against uh, two rooks where we need to play for coordination and after... Um, um, yeah, you can uh, exploit weaknesses and the queen of course should make use of double attack. Um, I wanted to show you one more time uh, one example, but for today it will be too much. Um, it was the game uh, which I can advise you to have a look at. It's the game between um, Nino and Sevian. Um, uh, Sevian won the game. And what is very nice about it is you can see how active um, uh, his uh, king uh, was playing part in the game and we saw in last uh, training Tuesday that uh, in the end game you need to use your king especially since uh, very often I see in the games of my pupils they they keep the king too too long on his place uh, but it's in the, in the end game it's a really a fighting unit which you should use um, so please uh, pay attention to this game and see how he's using his king and um, yeah, how everything uh, is, uh, yeah, is well done. Um, also, I wanted you to look have a look at the game between Anna Haas and um, um, Mr. Uh, Artimo. And um, uh, he, they were playing uh, also a very good game. He made some fabulous uh, tactics, which is already explained in many websites also. But actually the end game again is one of the interesting things uh, how you can um, uh, how you can get active. Uh, he was playing with a very nice uh, rook control. Um, he was playing he was exchanged to one of the rooks later on. He brought his king into play, uh, adjusting his pawns to keep on uh, uh, control of squares and in this way he was yeah he outplayed her simply. Uh, although I think that even if you look at the end game in the beginning, it was not that easy. And uh, if you don't trust me, then please uh, put this position on the board. Take your engine or a friend and play the position. You will see that it's not that easy to win this game. So also this is one of the important things if you want to improve. Um, look, um, look at the uh, yeah, look at interesting positions. Put them on the board and just play them and you will see yourself uh, which move you can make. Uh, bravo! Keep them in mind, see it as a good challenge to, to get better 
and um, of course if some moves could have been made better try to understand the principle behind it take our uh, yeah, lessons which we did before and hopefully next time you will get better um, I wanted to thank you for your attention um, I hope you have an enjoyable Tata uh, there are many shows please stay tuned to uh, to Chess24 um, and um, yeah I hope you have a nice time